Good morning. Mm. Good morning, y'all. I get asked of, I, quite often, actually, if I'm feeling homesick, because we've been through stuff, haven't we? Like, we landed, and then we had about a month and a bit together, and then, boom, isolation, and everything else came after that. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the question. The pastor, Nick, how are you doing? Are you, your family okay? Are you guys, like, feeling homesick with everything that's going on? And I want to be honest with you this morning, just a little, just a little. Have, it's been a while since I've seen a live kangaroo. Like, you know, I, I see them a lot where we come from and I haven't seen any in a long time. So that's making me a little homesick. The other thing that's making me a little homesick is that in Australia, we have clothes lines outside. Have you guys heard of that before, what a clothes line is? As I drive through my suburb and my area, I've, I've realized that, like, y'all don't have clothes lines and you depend heavily on the uh, dry uh, cleaner. And I, <laughs> I'm like, I mean, things shrink in there. And like, what do you do? Like, do you guys just keep buying new clothes? Like, what are we missing? And I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm finding that as I'm reading the things that we're putting in the dryer, that it says don't dry clean. Everything, don't dry, but why, why do we only have that? And you look outside, there are no clotheslines. So I'm missing that. And from Australia, everyone, everyone in Australia has a clothesline. Guess you didn't know. We all do. We don't have dry cleaning machines. And we, I mean, some of us do, but you know, clothesline. And we have a veranda at the front, and most of us have a rocking chair. And we just watch, you know, koalas climb up gum trees. This is life. So I'm missing a bit of that at the moment. I'm missing my family. But the, the, the truth is, I mean, not, not so much. Like, I love my family, but we feel like we've got family here now. And, it's, and it feels like home. Like, we feel like we're at home. We're, we're part of you guys. So we're doing okay. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for asking I mean, I was uh, preparing for this sermon, and uh, a thought came to mind this morning. I want to share a story with you about me and my dad, and, and you guys might be able to relate a little here, but um, I, when I was in school, when I was in high school or college, as you would call it, or senior school, whatever, um, we used to have parent-teacher interview days, nights. Do you remember those? Parent-teacher, when the, when the school says, hey, parents, come and talk to the teachers so they can tell you how your son's doing or your daughter's doing. Do you guys have those here? You do. All right. So I, I, uh, I'd prepare myself for those appointments because they were quite scary. Because you know, the problem with me was, in, like, I'm, I, I didn't mind learning. I'm a learner. I'm okay with learning. I like reading and learning new stuff, but not everything was interesting. And when I, when I, got, when I get bored, I, you know, I just switch off. I don't know if you kids do that sometimes or some of your parents remember that time, but maybe you weren't like me. But I just switched off. And in that time of switching off, I'd, I'd want to distract other people. Because I can't be switched off alone. Like, that's, that's, that's just as bad as being bored. And so I'd switch off, and, and I want others to switch off with me. So then I would, I would kindly entertain others. And my teacher would call that distraction. And, and therefore, um, at parent-teacher evenings would come... I would be on my absolute best behavior at home just before that evening. So dad used to send me to piano lessons. I used to have piano lessons every mo- uh, once a week, and I'd play every morning before going to school. And, and you know, on, on, <laughs> on parent-teacher interview evenings, man, I'd play morning. I'd play when I come home from school. I'd play as my dad walked into the house. Man, I'd play for the whole community. You know what I mean? I want dad to see that I'm a good kid. And he knew, and I had no idea that he knew what I was up to until I, got, until I got kids, right? And so he knew what I was up to, but he didn't say anything. He just let me play the charade. And, and anyway, we, um, we, you know, we're in the car together driving to the school for a parent-teacher interview, for a parent-teacher judgment. That's what that was. That's exactly what that was. And, uh, and, and you know, I'd, I'd be super quiet in the car until I feel like, you know, I need to say something to Dad. We need to assess where Dad is at. Do you do, do, you do that sometimes? I need, to, I need to know where Dad's mind is at. Like, is he in a good mood? I need to understand his character today. Like, is he upset? Was, was things good at work for him? Like, how much trouble am I going to be in, all right? That's what I'm trying to assess and determine. So I'm like, you know, hey, Dad, um, hey, get, your car looks so clean, when did you get time to do this? It's amazing. And he wouldn't say a word. I'd come up with all sorts of things like, you know, Dad, I was thinking of learning, you know, um, Canon in D for you for Christmas. And I was thinking you might like me to play that. And he wouldn't say a word. And that told me something. That t- told me that Dad didn't have a good day at work. 
And, and if the teacher didn't say good stuff about me, I was in big trouble. Judgment was coming. And I'm not that silly, by the way, because I'd look after my teachers before parent-teacher interview. Before I left school, I'd buy them stuff. I'd buy them chocolate. I'd let them know how awesome they are. I think when I was young, this is a true story. I, th- I was in like junior school. I bought my teacher lipstick. And like, parent-teacher interview was coming. You've got to do things. And so here we are at parent-teacher interview. And my dad, look, you know, ethnic parents, but we're different. I've got to tell you something, right? Listen to this. We rock up to this parent-teacher interview. And, and, and the very fact that I'm nervous and my dad can sort of feel that and see that in me, he wants to hit me. Like, he just wants to give me a boom. <laughs> and you can see the aggression in him. And he's looking at me like he just wants to give me a slap across the head. And I'm looking, I'm going, oh, man, and we haven't even started yet. And we sit down, and the teacher's looking at me, and I can see that she's going to throw me under the bus, a little bit like what Carolina did to me this morning. I just could tell. I love you, my sister. It was fine, Bala. It was good. I could tell she was going to take me apart. So we sat down, and and I'm sitting down. The teacher's looking at me, and she's got her pen out. And when teacher's playing with her pen, you know it's serious. And she looks at me, and, and you know what dad says? This is ethnic parents for you. He goes... My son, and he has an accent, my dad has an accent, he says, my son, if you need to hit him anytime, you can hit him. <laughs> I hit him, my wife hits him, my brother hits him, everybody hits him. If you feel you need to hit him, you just hit him. <laughs> and can you imagine, I know you guys are laughing, you got the masks on so you can't really, but I'm, I'm being serious, I'm looking at the teacher thinking, I'm dead. Not only am I going to get seated at home because I'm being stupid, but now the teacher has been given permission to hit me, and it was horrible. And the teacher would just tell Dad about the things that I did, and almost every report had something like, Nick distracts other kids. And I was hoping that Dad's English wasn't perfect at the time, but, you know, in, in Mauritius, where you know, Dad was born and he came from, um, English was a second language, and they learned that at school, and he understood what distraction means. He said to me in the car, I want to hit you. <laughs> totally get that, Dad. I want you to fight that urge. All right, Dad, I want you to look at me now, and I want you to just fight that urge. Just surrender, Dad. Surrender that urge to Jesus right now. All right, let him be your commitment. Let him be your Lord and Savior right now. Let him take over. Let him take control. And that doesn't help, but he did a little. He said to me, I need you to stop distracting other kids. And he was serious. And when dad doesn't say much, you know he's serious. And that was my first real experience of what judgment might look like. And I know that some of us here this morning and those of you who are watching online are a little afraid of judgment, especially when things are not looking so good in our community, especially when the world feels like it's falling apart. I mean, what could come next, right? Right? I mean, the very fact that we have riots and, and buildings on fire is because people are looking for a motive. Like, we need to understand, was George murdered or was it an accident? And we need answers. We need things to change. And there is noise and there is rebellion and there's disrupt, dis, 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 disruption across the country as a result. I get that. People are looking for answers. If God loves me, if love is love, if God loves me, why does he want to hurt me? That's the argument. Why do I go through pain? Why do I go through suffering? That is the argument. And you and I have been on a journey for a little while now, and you know that's not what God's character is all about. You and I believe and understand that he is the very opposite. He created this planet Earth and the universe for you and me. Being heirs of the kingdom of God simply means that everything that he created and designed was for you and me to enjoy. That's why he made us. Are you with me? That's the only reason why he made us. Love gives, and he just creates so that we can enjoy, we can have, so we know that's not the God. Why are we afraid of judgment? Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 7. We've been, oh, by the way, for those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago when I shared the beginning of this, this prophecy, you guys learned that we are the, the angels in this prophecy. 
We're the ones that are bringing this good news to the world. Every person in this world is going to hear the wonderful good news. What the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And all of God's people say, Hallelujah, this is me. This is what I've been called to do. This is exactly what God wants me to do. Some of you guys are thinking in your seats right now, maybe, Lord, I, I need to do this. I need to do that, Father. I need some direction in my life. I need to understand your will. Here it is. God has called you to bring the good news to the entire world. And let's start with Tulsa. Let's start with Tulsa. And now the Bible tells us what this good news is all about. And you know, there are some things about God that we just run from. Isn't that the truth? There are just some things about what the Bible says and what God does that we're just like, ah, let's skip over that chapter. That one doesn't, I don't like that chapter. I don't like the killing and the consequences. I don't like that. And we just skip, and this is one of those chapters, if you like, one of those few verses that we like to skip over, this very next bit. Are you ready? Check this out. Here's the good news that we are bringing to the world. Saying with a loud voice. Saying with what? A loud voice. voice. Not like this, not hidden. Not, oh, hope nobody hears this. Jesus loves you. (laughs) With a loud voice. Meaning stand on your rooftop and tell your community, here's what we're saying. Are you ready? Yeah, you're going to think this is crazy. Fear God. And give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Dun, dun, dun. And we are super afraid of that. And you know, as clever human beings, as theologians, as Christians who have studied the word of God, we look at that word fear and we make up wonderful excuses for what it might mean. Are you with me? We look at this word fear and we say, well, it actually means uh, uh, to honor God and uh, to recognize his, his greatness, his lordship. It's, it's this word and it's in its correct context and it's in its uh, 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 meaning of the ancient Greek simply means to be in awe of him. Rubbish! What did I say? You don't like that word? You guys don't say rubbish here. Bin. What do you say instead of rubbish? Trash. (laughs) Nonsense. This word in the ancient Greek, as John is writing and seeing a vision, he is seeing the word which actually means be afraid. Did I just ruin your Christianity? I'm sorry. Did did I just mess that up? Be afraid. That's exactly what it is. And when you see that kind of stuff, man, you've got to skip over that verse straight away because the last thing I want when I need Jesus the most in my life is being afraid of the very person who saves me. Are you with me? Be afraid. God tells us to do things sometimes and we're just like run in the opposite direction. You know the story of Jonah? And God is trying to teach Jonah his heart for Nineveh. And Jonah's reflecting on Nineveh. And he's like, man, that place is horrible. That place needs to just like burn down. Those people are crazy. They're evil. They're horrible, evil, crazy people. And God says, can you go and let them know that they're going to change the crazy, evil, horrible ways or they will self-destruct. They will destroy themselves and everybody around them. And I'm not going to let that happen. And Jonah's like, huh, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, Sure. And goes in the opposite direction. As far opposite as possible, Jonah goes. Sometimes God says stuff in his word that make us want to head in the opposite direction. That's the truth. Fear God. Because what? The hour of his judgment has come. I'm going to share something with you. Look, I'm, you know, we're into Bible theology and you you know my background, you know where I'm from and all that kind of stuff. And some of you don't, you dare say he didn't study. That's not the truth. I did. And I didn't finish my studies at college, but I studied, man. I studied at home. I'm making up for lost time. The hour of 
His judgment, friends. Let me tell you this. I'm not sure what you believe about this judgment. It is not our judgment. Can somebody say, can somebody say hallelujah? hallelujah? You want to be saying hallelujah. It is not the hour of my judgment. It is the hour of His. It is the hour of His judgment has come. Is God true, fair, and just? Can I trust Him with my life? Are His words enough for me? Does His government stand in a space of turmoil? Is God true and just? I want you to judge for yourself this morning. Well, you can be the jury. I want you to, to judge for yourself. And let me tell you where judgment first came from. We're going to go back in time. Before we come up with a, with a verdict and with a conclusion, I need to give you some context. Here's where judgment comes from. If you have your Bible, open it with me to Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 14 to 15. I'm hoping that we might have it on the screen. Check this out. The Bible says this in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 14 and 15. You were, now talking about Lucifer here, by the way, guys, because you know where things started going wrong. Let's just cut to the point, all right? You, Satan, you don't understand. When I say Lucifer, I mean, I mean Satan. And you know what the name Satan means, right? Do you guys know what the name Satan means? It, it's just fitting for this topic on judgment. Satan simply means accuser. That's what his name means. Okay, so check this out. We're talking about Lucifer here. Verse uh, 28 of Ezekiel, chapter 28, verse 14 and 15, the Bible says this. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. I, uh, you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. At this point, there is no judgment in heaven. At this point, everyone is getting along. Would you agree? I mean, as you're reading this and as God is talking about Lucifer, you know that everything's good, right? Because we know that Lucifer deceivers, the person that first planted this idea that God ain't good. So whilst we're saying that Lucifer, about Lucifer, that he is good, you know that there's no judgment happening anywhere on the universe. All things are good until something happens. The Bible says this, until iniquity, until wickedness, until rebellion against the law of love was found in you, Lucifer. Now, what was Lucifer's problem? I mean, the guy had it all, didn't he? He's an angel for crying out loud and a special one too. He had a good voice, I hear. He still does. Oh, we'll talk about that one later. What was his problem? What was it about the law of love? And that's who God is, right? God is love according to Scripture. What was it about this law of love, this principle of love who God is that upset him so much? I don't want you to guess. Isaiah chapter 14. Just check this out, guys. I want you to bear with me. Isaiah chapter 14 tells us exactly what was happening in his heart, all right? Isaiah chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 13 and 14. Some of you are like, man, I need more context here, Pastor Nick. I need a little bit more studying. I need some more biblical background to what you're saying. And I say, yes, I'd love to give you more. So if that's you, whether you're here in the audience or online, I want you to message us and tell us you'd like to have Bible studies so I can do that with you. And if you're the audience, take the card in front of you and say, I would like to study the Bible so that we can have that discussion with you. All right, check this out. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 to 14, the Bible says this about Lucifer, about the accuser, Satan. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And here's where things get super tricky. I will be like the most high. Why? Why? 
And some of us have decided that simply Lucifer wanted to be worshipped. Guys, I'm just going to burst that bubble. Let's just get real for a second. Who would, you, who would you worship? Let's just put these two guys, let's put these two characters who are going to be on trial very soon. Let's just put these characters up for on stage right now and you tell me who you would worship and consider yourself as an intelligent, supernatural being, all right? You see stuff and you know stuff. You've seen things happen, all right? You've got God, by the way, creator, redeemer, able to bring nothing into existence. And then you have Lucifer, who sings well, very clever, beautiful wings. Who would you worship? Come on, let's get real for a second. Who would you worship? That's an obvious one. Even if you didn't like that guy, that guy has some crazy power going on. Right? You with me? It wasn't about worship. He knew he would lose that battle. Who on earth would want to worship him when that guy can do a lot more? A lot more is going on with God than with Lucifer. It wasn't about worship. Okay. Well, if it wasn't about worship, perhaps it was about power. Perhaps he wanted to have the power that God has. Man, that comes from the movies. Now, when you sit on the throne of the, of the previous king, then suddenly, magically, supernaturally, all of the power is absorbed from the chair and comes into you. That doesn't happen. If he makes himself higher and mightier than God, supernaturally there is no crown that is transitioned from the head of God into Lucifer that gives him and makes him all powerful. That's in the movies. That's not what's happening. Lucifer knew that it wasn't about power because he ain't God, y'all. You with me? He ain't God. He knows what he can't touch, what he can't be, what he can't have. A little bit like me and okra. You guys eat okra here? But I, don't, I'm, I can't do it. Like I want to. I see it. I'm like, everyone loves it in Oklahoma. It's like a Tulsa thing. I want to eat it. I mean, you sell it everywhere. You can do okra drive throughs I want to be there, but I, I just know between okra and I, we just can't. Can... You get the point. And I'm glad that you guys like okra, by the way. It's fine. So it's not about the power, it's not about the worship. He would fail. What's the problem then? What's the issue? He ain't stupid. There is something that he wants. There is something about God that he cannot have. And I'm going to dare to say this morning that it's fair enough. Did I just say that? Listen to this. Lucifer has God as authority, the principle of love, as authority over his life. Is that true or false? It's true. Lucifer has the authority of the the, the, the love of God, the principle of love, the law of love. He has the authority of God above him. He is subject to the law of love. Are you with me? Lucifer, like every creation in this universe and outside, whatever it is, are subject to the law of love. Except for God. It's true. Except for, who is over God? Who can be over God? Who can expect or demand that God lives out love? Who can encourage? Who can beg, plea with God to exert the law of love? No one. In the devil's mind, that was freedom. In Lucifer's mind, that was freedom. That was liberty. God had something that he didn't. God was outside of any principle called love, whereas Lucifer and you and I aren't. Now, if you don't understand love, You can start to stress a little bit and your heart's going a little faster right now thinking, man alive. 
Then you start to realize that there are people, maybe you know, perhaps even in yourself, that this is the kind of freedom that I've been looking for. In fact, atheism, all right, to be against, anti, away, and separate from God is to simply reject the moral law, the law of love. And they don't just hide that fact, but they tell you straight up, Nietzsche and his friends Voltaire will tell you openly the reason why that we are atheists is simply because we do not want to have to answer to God's law of love. We don't want to feel guilty as a result of breaking the law of love. And you know where that gets you guys. You've seen Hitler. And you've seen some crazy characters out there demonstrate exactly that theory. That that desire, that mentality, that ideology ultimately leads you to destruction. So what is it about love that is appealing to you and I? That makes us want to stay on course? What makes us want to stay with God and trust Him with our lives? Lucifer was no idiot. If God truly is love and he loves me, then why can't I not have any restrictions over me just like him? You know, he did the same thing with Adam and Eve, by the way. Do you guys remember the story? In Genesis chapter 3, he did the same thing with Adam and Eve. What did he tell them? Well, have a look what your Bible says. Then the serpent said to the woman, do you remember this in verse 4 of chapter 3? For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He tells intelligent, fresh human beings who know a lot of stuff, mind you, that God has something that you and I don't. And God doesn't want you to touch that fruit because the day that you touch that fruit, God knows that we are going to be equal just like him having no restrictions over our lives, not having to submit to the law of love, God is keeping you from freedom. Are you guys getting the point? Lucifer wanted complete autonomy. I want to be like the most high. Why? I do not want to have the restrictions of the law of love ruling over my life. Let me ask you a question. What, what is love? What is love? It's a hard question, isn't it? Love is to give of yourself unconditionally to benefit someone else. The law of love is to give of yourself unconditionally so that you may benefit somebody else, so that you may benefit others. And Lucifer Now some of you are like, well, he ain't that crazy. I've seen the same thing around, right? Lucifer was sick and tired of day in and day out having to live selflessly. Are you with me? Lucifer had enough of having to put others before himself, having to look at other people before his own interest. But love can do no different, friends. I mean, I'm a parent now. I have four kids. Not now. I've been a parent for a while. I've got four of them. They don't, you know, they come after a while, about nine months after each other. And so I've had kids. I, I, I know that my love for them just changes my behavior. I have restrictions now because of my love for my kids. Once upon a time, when I got a paycheck, I would spend it the very next day on all sorts of crazy things. Are you with me? He did the same. Clothes, food, cars, partying. 
Now that I have children, for some reason I'm compelled. I, I, I don't feel the restrictions. I never look at my world thinking, oh man, I can't believe I've got to spend this money to feed my children. Because I love my children. It doesn't even enter my mind. There's an automatic restriction because of love. I choose not to do certain things, but I choose to be a blessing to my kids. Are you guys with me? Lucifer preferred not to. He wanted to be free from the law of love. There's a, there's a problem with that if you don't really understand what the law of love is. Now the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 31, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Jesus tells us, here's a summary of my law of love. Are you ready? Love God and love each other. That's it. That's all it is. Love God and love each other. And in James chapter 2, verses 12, the Bible says, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Every law that God has given us that has come out of his mouth to benefit the children, the human beings, these creatures, is the law of love, which is also called the law of liberty. In fact, the love that I give you is meant to liberate you. That doesn't make sense, Pastor Nick, because you know it's restrictive. Let me explain. I'm driving down a highway. Perhaps Garnet. I'm learning roads. All right. Many lanes. A crazy person on Garnet is speeding, not thinking about anyone else but himself, right? Are you with me? He is crazy. He's not thinking about loving me and my family and how this could damage other people if he goes out of control. He is just gunning it and going crazy. But the law of love says, you know what? I'm going to put traffic lights in place so that when you do go through a green light, you don't have to worry about some crazy person hitting you. Are you with me? But that's restrictive. Without the lights, you'd be dead. Hmm. I pray that my children will not become alcoholics or drink alcohol. That's my prayer. We know what it does to your kidney. We know what it does to your behavior and to your mind. And so my plan is to tell my children at the right age, at the right time, don't drink alcohol. It's not good for you. If they don't drink alcohol, do you think supernaturally or mentally it gives me some credit? Do you think when they resist alcohol, I feel better about myself, more superior than the day before, greater than I have ever been? Not at all. As a parent, when I see my children doing what is right, it gives me peace because I know that, we are, that, that they are not going to hurt themselves. Does that make sense? And so we tell them things out of love. We tell them that there are restrictions that come with love, not because it gives me points and it gives me a better feeling, but because that's what love does. It protects, it prolongs, it encourages and helps you to live a better life. When my children want to eat things from the ground in public, I stop them and they look at me. Why is it being restrictive? I want to put that gum in my mouth. Why is it being restrictive? Because I know if he puts that gum in his mouth, he's going to end up in the hospital because his stomach is not doing good things. And the hours that we're going to spend in hospital isn't going to be favorable for him. Are you with me? But as a parent, I'm going to be at the hospital. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to comfort him. I'm going to pray for him. I'm there with him the whole way. It doesn't, it doesn't ruin my life, but it ruins his life. He could have been playing in the playground. He could have been having some awesome fun, but he's in a hospital now, and I had warned him. And here's the beautiful thing about love, by the way. Even if he does pick up that chewing gum, even if he does drink that alcohol, I'm going to be there with him. And if the alcohol destroys his kidney, here's the thing about love. I'm going to give him mine. 
No questions asked. It's my son. Why wouldn't I? I will do whatever it takes to protect you. God does the same thing on Calvary. He warns us. He tells us, do not be separate from me. Keep my commandments. If you love me, trust me with your life. I have given you the law of love to protect you so that you may have a fulfilled life here on earth. And when we mess up and when we break the word of God and when we go against his word, he says, let me give you my heart. I will die so that you may live. I will give my life. I have warned you. I have told you. And you've still messed up. This is love. It's to give of yourself unconditionally so that you may benefit and bless others. Lucifer didn't quite get that. Now, I've got, I got a couple of quotes I want to share with you. Just so you understand that I'm not just making this stuff up about freedom. That Lucifer was only wanting his freedom from the law of love. Listen to this. This comes from Lucifer and Greaves. He's the president of the Satanic Temple. In 2019 of March the 9th, he writes this. Satanism is about personal sovereignty and independence and freedom of will. Giving us a picture of what it is to follow in Lucifer's footsteps. A priest from the Satanic Temple, Benedict Atkins, says this on April the 14th of 2018 on BBC UK. People interpret it in different ways, but me, but to me, he says, Satanism was about loving yourself at the expense of others. In a philosophical sense, it's actually got little to do with devil worship. Most Satanists believe in doing everything in their power to get what they want out of life. It doesn't sound so satanic anymore, does it, friends? It sounds a little close to home. God's law of love, who he is, comes across restrictive. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this for your friends. Here's the reality. If you lie, you will not only hurt other people, but yourself. Same as if you cheat. Same as if you steal. Same as if you kill. And all of the universe watched Lucifer for centuries display what it's like to live outside of God's law of love. Freedom from the law of love. And God has let him, right? Because that's who he is. He's not a tyrant. He lets him. And the whole universe watches to what end? When will Lucifer stop? When will people realize and understand that outside of the law of love, having freedom from God's law of love is destructive? Eventually, he sends his son to earth. His only son by you. He cannot create another one. Don't ask me how that works. But he gives his only son and sends him to earth. That he may teach and preach and share what the love of God looks like. And it's manifested through a human form. This is what love looks like. And what does freedom do? What does freedom do? Freedom from the law of love? It murders God. Freedom from the law of God kills God, murders him. Jesus in his humanity felt the separation. His father told him that this would come and that he would raise again, rise again. But in his humanity, he said, Lord, I, my father, my father, I cannot, I cannot live without you. I'm feeling the separation. And the universe is watching on. This is what freedom from the law of God does. Jesus dies. He dies. <laughs> Jesus just before his last breath says, Lucifer, this rebellion, this freedom that you desire, this liberty you want so much outside of God's law of love is useless. 
doesn't work. It doesn't help anyone. It ruins people. It's finished. It's over. And the universe rejoices. And the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, the universe says, therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the, in the heavens, rejoice. Heaven is happy. They have realized that God, his law of love, the entire time has been right, has been true. And anything outside of that law of love, so-called freedom, so-called liberty from the moral law, from what God has called us to do that he's planted in our hearts. Freedom from that is, is over. Praise the Lord. Rejoice, O oh heavens, when you guys come here on Saturday mornings to worship with our worship team. You are rejoicing and saying hallelujah because you know that freedom from the love of God is futile. It's useless. You've experienced it during the week. You've been hurt. You've been tested. You've been pulled. You've been stretched. You've been discouraged. But nothing can separate you from the love of God. And so when you come here on Saturday morning, when you are singing praises, you are saying hallelujah because it is your testimony. It is your response to that freedom that comes within the law of love. Revelation 12, 12 continues and says that, you know, the time for the devil is now short. And I don't know how you read your Bibles, but the Lucifer, that devil, he has had access to heaven up to this point. But from here on, the Bible says that he was cast out, never to be allowed in heaven again. That principle of freedom from the law of love cannot be allowed. We don't want it. We want nothing to do with it in heaven. Pastor, are you preaching salvation by works? No, get that out of your mind. That's not what I said. And Jesus would give you his heart if you disobeyed him. He would die that you may live. This is not a matter of salvation, guys. The only way that you and I are saved is by what? The blood of Jesus Christ, amen? Period. There's no ifs and buts. But what keeps you Trusting in Jesus. What helps you to journey through this difficult journey here on earth and what helps you to keep things into perspective in all of the universe is the law of love. And if you do understand the law of love as I explained to you and as you experience and read about Calvary, you know that in fact this law of love liberates you and I. It liberates us. How? It helps us to live better. Outside of the law of love, your days are numbered. Either you will destroy yourself or somebody else, but eventually you will destroy yourself. That's what Lucifer showed us. Here's what Jesus says about his law of love. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it, what? more abundantly. Jesus says in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The law of love isn't painful. It isn't terrible. When I tell you to trust me and to love me and to love others, it is easy to do. It is light. My question for you today, as you have accepted in the past and you may need to reconsider this again, Are you willing to surrender your desire to be free from God's law of love? Are you prepared to surrender and allow the law of love, even if it means restricting you from things that are damaging your life, are you willing to trust Jesus with it? The Bible has not kept a secret from us, not one. The Bible has given us and told us the principle of freedom from the law of love leads to ultimate destruction. Are you, my friends, you watching right now online, are you willing to surrender all of that, all of your fears about being restricted because of the law of love? Are you prepared to surrender the freedom that you supposedly have that is above the law of God so that you may truly live in liberty in Christ? Say amen. 
Now when you read John 3.16, it has more meaning. Listen to this. For God so loved the world that he gave. Are you with me? That he gave. Love is to give unconditionally to benefit others. The accusation that Lucifer had against God. What are you to give? Who stands above you? Who keeps you accountable and responsible? And God says, let me show you. I will send my son. I will give my only son. I cannot create another. He is not created. Don't ask me how that works. But let me give you of myself. Let me give you of myself so that you may live. That is God's response to Lucifer. His love, his heart, his very existence is displayed through Calvary. I created everything for you that you may enjoy my creation. Everything I have is yours. Every principle I have given you through my word is to protect you, to help you and to give you a better life. Not only now, but for eternity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would trust in him, live with him, surrender their selfishness to him, would enjoy, experience life eternal. Some of you guys have been running from God, from His law of love, because you have felt that it has been too restrictive. There are sins. There are habits. There are movies. There are women or there are men. There are substances. There are behaviors. You haven't been willing to part with for some time now. Every time you hear the word of God and every time the Holy Spirit calls your heart, you're at war with it. Because you know, because you know that God doesn't want you to be doing those things. And your excuse has always been, God is restrictive. If he truly loves me, he'll let me do what I want. This morning, if this is you, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. Outside of the law of love leads to self destruction. It may not happen now, it may not happen tomorrow. Outside of God's principle of love leads to suffering. And God does not want you to suffer. And if this has been your journey, man, don't be shy. Don't be afraid. We're all human. We've all been there. We're we're all there, perhaps. I want you to pick up that card in front of you and then say, Lord, I want you to run that card and say, Lord, I need a change in my life. I want to surrender my selfishness, the freedom that I show that I want to have, a freedom away from you. I want to surrender all of that. And I want to live in within your law of love. I want you to write that down on that card right now. And what we're going to do is at the end of the service, we're going to collect those cards and we're going to give you a call and help you on that journey. And if you're watching from home or in the car or wherever you may be, I want you to send us a message through our Facebook page or through YouTube, wherever it is, and let us know that you want change. You want to, be, you want to surrender. You want to be restored. You want to live within God's principle of love so we can connect with you. This has been my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with us. I'm going to declare again that Christ is enough for us.
God is on trial. He is right now as we speak. Has He been fair? Has He been true? Has He been just? Have you not read? Have you not seen? Have you not heard that He has given you everything so that you may live and live well and may have life eternally? The people who are afraid in that judgment are those who desire to live outside of His will outside of his love. They are afraid because they know, they know that he has done everything. When God stands on trial, none of us can say that God missed a beat, God missed a point. He wasn't there. He didn't do it right. He didn't try everything. Those are the ones who will be afraid, but not you and I. 
we have nothing to fear. But glory goes to God because he has been just, he has been true, he has been fair the whole time. Can I hear an amen if you believe that is the truth? Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you for your sacrifice and your son Jesus. Father, the entire world, the universe watched on as Lucifer accused you of not allowing people to have freedom from you. And you watched on, Lord, and with your own eyes you cried and you saw what it led them to ultimately killing, killing your son. Yet you gave, and I want to thank you for Jesus. Yet you gave because this whole thing this great controversy, everything, Father, that we are fighting for within ourselves and perhaps with you, Lord, has always been about our freedom and our peace and the, and the experience of this world that you have created for us. And for that, Lord, if we have drifted away from understanding that, if we have drifted away from accepting the sacrifice of your Son, if we have drifted away, Father, from you and the wonderful principles of love, we say, Forgive us, forgive me. Create in me a good heart and a good spirit, Lord. Father, I just uh, I pray for everybody who's here this morning and those who are watching online. They've been harboring something, Lord, that has been keeping them from, from experience, experiencing true freedom, that they may surrender all of that this morning, right now. Lord, the devil has lied. He told us that freedom outside of your love is better. And he failed. And the universe rejoiced when Jesus rose again and conquered the grave so that you and I, every person here, Lord, may experience life eternal. Free. Free from Lucifer's lies and accusations. True freedom and liberty in your word, in your love. Father, please help my church family and I to trust you with our lives. A lot of us are confused right now with what's going on. Many of us are hurting, Father. Please help us, Lord to experience freedom in trusting you with everything. Everything, Father. I want to thank you, Lord, for giving us your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.